This is a dominant presentation. So uh, uh, just before I uh, came here, I was waiting for uh, Sin Sin to pick me up and I uh, picked up a, a, a random book and uh, I happened to be sitting there and, and just, just leafing through and there was a um, statement to the effect that um, Buddhists, uh, uh, I remember the word gloomy and uh, gloomy and depressed or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I won't mention the uh, author's name. He probably doesn't deserve to be known, but remembered for that statement. But there is this kind of feeling, you know, that you get sometimes that that um, Buddhism's Buddhists are sometimes depressed or depressing because we talk about dukkha and stuff all the time, and. Uh, especially Theravada, right? I mean, the Tibetans, at least you get to sort of bang some drums and draw some... <laughs> draw some pretty pictures and stuff like that. So there's this kind of idea about what, what Buddhism is, which people sometimes get from the, the, uh, uh, from the, the teachings, especially about like the Four Noble Truths, and it starts with suffering and so on. But it's curious, it doesn't seem to relate all that much to actual people, does it? I haven't, I haven't noticed in my life that Buddhists are any more inherently gloomy than anybody else. I mean, we can be gloomy and depressed sometimes, but, you know, that's our right. We're humans. We can be gloomy and depressed if we want to. Yay, depressed. <laughs> <laughs> can you turn the volume up slightly? It's hard to hear you. Maybe I'm going there. There's a seat here. There's a seat over here, John, if you want to come. I will try to raise my voice a little bit, <laughs> but as we don't have a PA, I can't raise it too much. <clears throat> so, so we're kind of gloomy and depressed. I mean, there's one uh, uh, story which I always liked, which is in the, the uh, commentary to the rule, which uh, it says that the monks aren't allowed to play music, but it says that it's okay if you just happen to hear it without intending to. Right? Typical kind of Theravadan kind of nitpicking about what, when is it all right to listen to music or not. But anyway, then... It goes on to tell the story of a monk who was going for alms round in the village. And when he was going for alms, he heard a slave woman singing a song about the sufferings of life. Right? So we invented the blues, right? <laughs> what else could it be, right? <laughs> and when he heard that, and he reflected on Dukkha and he became enlightened. So that's proof you can get enlightened by, by listening to the blues. <laughs> but that's interesting though, why, why do people like listening to the blues? Why do people like listening to sad songs? Yeah? Resonates. Sorry? Probably. It resonates with you. It makes you feel sadder, does it? <laughs> <laughs> I 
I mean, sometimes when you're sad and then you hear like a really happy song, it makes it worse, doesn't it? It's like, oh, God, I can't stand it. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? Yeah? You'd think, you'd think if, it was, if you're sad, you'd want to hear something happy. But actually, when you're sad, you want to hear something sad. I guess, I guess it makes you feel not quite so alone in the world. Yeah? Yeah. Ah, they know how I feel. <laughs> yeah, it's not quite so bad. If you can be sad with somebody else, it's not quite so bad. One of the, the problems with this idea about the, you know, this idea that Buddhism is pessimistic is that it, it, it comes from a, a misunderstanding or a mis, misconstrual of the, uh, the what, first of all, what dukkha is, what we translate as suffering, and also about like, what the, the context and the meaning of it is within the teachings. Actually, there's a very interesting uh, passage uh, which is it's like one of the standard passages you find many times in the suttas, and it talks about uh, it's a thing called the Anupubbhikata, the gradual teaching. And it's where the Buddha is uh, teaching somebody and he uh, first of all teaches um, about uh, simple things, about uh, precepts, about the advantages of giving and generosity and kindness and about the, uh, the dangers of uh, uh, the defilements and uh, you know, bad behaviors and so on. And then... Uh, and gradually leads them up from from more and more simple things up to more and more subtle things, and then and then it has this passage where where when he sees that their mind is uh, uplifted, full of joy, serene, clear, yeah, then he will reveal to them the the, the special teachings of the, of the Buddhas, which is the four noble truths, dukkha. The origin, suffering, the origin of suffering, the ending of suffering, and the path leading to the ending of suffering. So this is the Buddha's special technique. First of all, he makes you really happy and peaceful, and then he gives you the bad news. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is the answer to that, that perennial question, you know, which comes first, the good news or the bad news, right? The good news always should go first, okay? But one of the things that that points to is that this difference in, in dukkha between dukkha as like a psychological uh, sadness and depression, and dukkha in its more profound sense. And uh, I, uh, it, it's something a bit like the that distinction that I mentioned when I was talking about meditation earlier, and I mentioned this difference in the Western philosophical tradition between hedonic happiness and uh, eudaimonic happiness, the, the the pleasure which you experience or the pleasure or pain that you just experience, and the pleasure or pain that comes from a sense of meaning or fittingness of life. I don't know if it's exactly the same, but it's something similar, or some, 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 not, not, it's just somehow related to that. So dukkha, in that sense, that, that profound sense in the Dhamma, doesn't just mean suffering feeling, um, but it means... Um, has something to do with that that uh, sense of, of, of uh, uh, the fitness of life, like the, that that one one is living in accordance with the truth, in accordance with the Dhamma. So if we if we hold the the Dhamma to be that that which is of greatest value, that which is the most high and the most the thing which we should we want to orientate our life towards, of course the a lot of the the, the suffering that we have comes because. A lot of the time, our life isn't like that. <laughs> it's not. It's not actually lived with the Dhamma. It's not actually lived in accordance with what we believe to be right, to be proper, to be true. And we find ourselves constantly going the other way, being pulled towards doing things that are unwholesome or harmful or hurtful. And so, because we feel this kind of tension, then this is one of the more subtle aspects of of dukkha. And so, when there's a realization of Dhamma, a realization of the truth, and letting, letting go of those um, tendencies within oneself that drag you away from the Dhamma, then that kind of dukkha ceases. 
But that's quite a, a subtle. That's quite a subtle thing. If we come back from from that, we look at the the, the, the that, that that gradual teaching that the Buddha was talking about. One thing that's very uh, obvious from that is that the Buddha didn't didn't sort of sort of keep on banging on about suffering to people who weren't ready to hear about it, right? <laughs> so that's important to remember. He had to uplift people. And this is something which is very, very important and very powerful teaching that you see all the way through all, all the Buddha's meditation teaching is that the, 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 the path of practice, not just meditation, all the path of practice is a path of happiness a path of pleasure. And if you see the, the most beautiful and the most powerful uh, descriptions of the way of uh, practice which the Buddha taught in such detail and so often, then it's a, it's a, it's a description of these deeper and deeper and more subtle forms of happiness which you realize as your spiritual practice deepens. Uh, the classic example of that is the Samanyapala Sutta in the Diga Nikaya, the second sutta in the Pali Canon, in many ways the most magnificent of all the uh, Buddhist uh, scriptures. Uh, and in there uh, you have uh, King Ajatasattu, who was, he's almost the, uh, uh, the epitome or the archetype of, of this idea that I mentioned before of somebody who's been dragged both ways and both having a kind of a, a love for Dhamma and wanting to do the right thing, but also being so dominated by his own worldly uh, ambitions uh, that he ended up committing very terrible crimes and feeling very bad for it. I don't know how, how much I should get into telling the story of the Samanya Palasutta, but I, I probably shouldn't. It'll take too long. I gave some, some sutta classes on it at Santi a few years ago. I think that took about six months or something to do the, <laughs> the series of classes on that. So if you want to look at that, they can, they're probably online somewhere. Uh, but the idea is that when even, even the, the very beginnings of the practice, as it's describing there, then you, 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 you feel some sense of joy, some sense of relief. Even hearing... The very first time when you hear the teachings or you recognize it, it might not even be hearing. It might actually just be, it's often not hearing, it's often seeing. They have this concept in Indian uh, religion of samana dasana, like of seeing samanas, seeing ascetics or the, having the vision of somebody. It's like you see in the, in, the, in the story of the Buddha when he went forth from the palace. Yeah, And so he, he saw the old man, the sick man, the dead man, and each time he goes home to the palace and he's like depressed and brooding and like, oh... Yeah, what am I going to do? This is what life is. Yeah, life's so depressing. It's like every morning we get up and we read the paper, and it's suicide. It's another school shooting, and it's more bushfires, and it's this and it's that. It's so depressing, right? And so we should we, we we need we need to have the fourth sign in the in the in the newspapers, don't we? That when the Buddha went out and he saw the monk, yeah, and he was like, oh, maybe there's a possibility of something else. Maybe that's what you should do in the papers. Instead of having the page three girl, you should have a page three monk <laughs> or none. So on, so, or just someone sitting there peacefully in meditation. That'd be good, wouldn't it? And when you open up the paper in the morning, you say, oh, there's someone sitting there peacefully. So sometimes it's just seeing. I remember that that happened to me. You know, there was a few few times when I was uh, before I became a monk, and it's not it's not you know. I mean, the saying of seeing a monk is just a, just an example. I mean, in this case, I remember a few people that I met. I remember when I was working in um, uh, I was uh, uh, an activist working in animal liberation for a number of years, and there was one one of the women on the uh, in the group who would come sometimes, and uh, there was just something really special about her. You know, I, don't, I didn't, didn't really kind of know what it was. You know? And somebody told me, oh, she's a Buddhist, she's a meditator. I didn't know what a Buddhist was, you know, or meditation or anything like that. But there was something to her, you know, I just kind of noticed. Another one was a friend of mine who I used to play music with uh, in Perth. His name is Ross Bolita. 
and uh, he, he, we used to get him in to play uh, uh, keyboards in our band sometimes. And Ross had the, the, um, was a, a fantastic musician, but he was absolutely completely crazy. And he would do all these, these bizarre uh, things. I remember once we got him into the studio to do some uh, play. We had a ballad. We wanted him to play piano on this ballad. And so we had like all the charts and stuff ready for him. And then he came in and, and he, didn't, he wasn't interested at all in the, in the sheet music. And he just, he just went to the drum kit and unscrewed the cymbals from the drum kit and put them inside the grand piano and started sliding them around on the grand piano strings and plucking the strings of the piano. And we were looking at him and saying, <laughs> hey, Ross, you're you interested in the sheet music at all? Or, or we're just... We're just <laughs> and then this guy... And what was amazing about Ross, he was also he's quite a serious Zen Buddhist, and he, 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 he wasn't doing drugs or anything like that. He was very clean, and he, he was crazier than anybody I knew and make beautiful music. And he was, a, uh, he was quite a serious Zen practitioner. He actually became a, a Roshi in the, the, um, the uh, Diamond Sangha, Robert Aiken Roshi tradition. Later on, I went to his Roshi ceremony many years later. So these were like some people that I met, and somehow I knew that they were Buddhists or practitioners or meditators, and so it makes it made kind of an impression. I could look back many years later, and and think, oh, you know, there was something about them that sort of sparked something or awakened something. That there there is something possible. There's something else. But those seeds sometimes lay dormant for many years. Anyway, so but once we, this is really this is the this is the the, 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 the key to everything. The Buddha said that that when somebody who's oppressed with suffering uh, will respond in one of two ways: either they will uh, have despair, or they will have a search. Right? That's the two ways. Fantastic! I always love how the Buddha sort of distills distill these things down to such an powerful. Thing. I mean, isn't that what we've all experienced sometimes? You know, when you get sad and you get, you know, you're, you're sick or everything's going against you. And on the one hand is despair. Yeah? And that's so easy to fall into. Despair is always close at hand. Yeah? Giving up hope. Yeah? What's the point? <laughs> oh, it's a life. It's always it's always a kind of tempting, you know. You can you, you you can put down the burden. You don't have to don't have to try anymore. Yeah? So this is one choice that's always there. But the other choice is a search. Is there somebody somewhere who 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 has something that can can help me? That can say a word that can help to relieve me of this suffering. And so we've all been through suffering in our own lives. We're all still going through suffering. And when we come to the Dhamma, so to me this is, I find, I find this just silly, this idea of Buddhism being gloomy and pessimistic and so on, because the, the reality is it's just, it's a recognition of a truth. And when you when you hear the the teaching on dukkha, you go, oh, okay. That's how, yeah, that's how the world is. That's all right. And you're not making a big deal about it. You don't go around, you know, like I'm thinking of the, you remember the, 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 the monks in Monty Python and the Holy Grail? <laughs> Walking around with the planks of wood and hitting themselves over the head with them. <laughs> So yeah, but it's just an acknowledgement. Oh, okay, yeah, life's suffering. Oh, that, that's okay. And to be able to accept that is already an incredibly, an incredible relief. Oh, it's, it's, it's okay. You, you suffer, it's all right. And so when you hear that, that, that word of the Buddha, and he speaks to something which you know and experience and realize inside yourself, is that suffering? Yeah? 
this is when faith arises. Ah, oh, okay, I recognize that. There is somebody who has something that can help me. Right? That's when the, the rising of faith comes. And with the arising of faith is an incredible sense of joy, an incredible sense of relief. It's not a sense of joy and relief that comes from anything. It's, in, it's a joy and the relief that comes, that, that is just the letting go of that despair. Ah, the letting go of that darkness. I, I don't need to go there. There is something else. And that, that sense of joy that comes from that faith uh, in Buddhism we call pamoja. Sometimes they're translated as uh, gladness. And pamoja is, is a very ordinary emotion. Yeah? Pamoja is not necessary. It's not something which is, uh, you know, particularly exalted or refined. It's a, it's an ordinary sense of gladness that you can have if you're doing something like, you know, any anything that, that's wholesome that, that that you do. If you if you give somebody to something and 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 sorry, if you give something to somebody. Yes, that's right. If you give something, give a gift. You feel happy by giving a gift. Yeah, this is pamoja. If you, if, you, if you like to do some chanting and then you feel happy while you're bowing or doing the chanting, then this is pamoja. Yeah, if you're just doing a, doing a kindness or doing any kind of ordinary wholesome thing, then uh, this is pamoja that you feel. So this is, I think, a nice thing in... in in Pali is that we have these words, many, many words for subtle forms of happiness, which we don't necessarily have words for in English. Is there a word in English for, for, for a, a simple, wholesome happiness that's not just ordinary happiness? I don't, can't think of one. <laughs> joy. Serenity, joy. Yeah, something like that. Something like that. It's not quite satisfaction. Maybe joy. Felicity. Felicity. Ooh. <laughs> That's got several oh, syllables. Be Excellent. Had the completion of something that was morally worthy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's something like that. It's something like all of those words, yeah. Yeah, felicity is probably quite a good one. I don't know if you can use it in English these days, but it's a good word. Yeah. Anyway, so so this is just like this kind of ordinary emotion. Now, when you come to meditate, right, meditation then takes those ordinary feelings and builds on them. Right? It's, it's not a different thing. It's the same thing, but it takes it to a deeper level. When we come to meditate, we sit down. We have uh, we have some time. We have some space. We put aside all of our concerns. We put aside planning for the future. We put aside worrying for the past. And in that zone, we have safety. This is something which is very very important. And this is this is why I don't agree with the, the teachers that say you know you don't need to meditate. Just be mindful. I don't think this is right. And one of the important reasons why not is because you in the meditation the, the 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 whole point of the meditation creating that formal space when you're doing it is that you have like a sandbox you have somewhere where you have a, that safe place and anything that happens in that space can stay in that space right? anything that you feel you can just leave there that's okay anything that you think anything that happens it's all right and you can be pretty much guaranteed that if you meditate for long enough, it will happen. <laughs> right? Any kind of emotion that there's a word for, and quite a few that there are no words for, you will feel them. And you will feel them times 10. You will feel them times infinity. You'll feel them until there's nothing left to feel. And then you won't feel anything at all. And you'll look in there and think, there is nothing there. And then the world will explode. And then the world will burn down. And then the world will turn inside out. And then all of these other things will happen. If you stay there long enough, yeah? 
Over the years, as you keep on coming back to practice, all of these things will happen. And they can all stay there. Whatever happens. Yeah? You feel like screaming. Just scream. It's okay. <laughs> but in that, even though anything that can happen within that space, but the, 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 the direction or the flow of the practice, the overall direction of that flow is towards the deepening of that sense of spiritual happiness. So, uh, when, we, when, we, when we meditate, uh, for example, if we're watching the breath, we bring awareness to that soft feeling of the breath coming in and out, keeping the mind with that soft feeling of the breath, and bringing to that, that, that wholesome and positive emotional disposition. So the emotions that you're bringing to it are positive and whole. Right? It's not, you don't bring gloom to the breath, okay? <laughs> you bring joy to the breath, yeah? Is the whole Anapanasati Sutta, you know, there's, there's 16 steps of breath meditation. None of them are gloomily he watches, breathes in, gloomily he breathes out. No, this is not there. Anxiously one breathes in, anxiously one breathes out. That's not there either. Yeah. Uh, worrying whether he's doing it right, he breathes in. Worrying whether he's doing it right, he breathes out. That one's not there either. Yeah. But unfortunately, when we do breath meditation, they're the ones that we often do, right? <laughs> the actual ones that we're supposed to be doing is mindfully breathing in and mindfully breathing out. Breathing in, tranquilizing the breath, making peace with the breath, feeling joy, feeling rapture, feeling pleasure. These are the ones that the Buddha actually talked about right, in the breath meditation. <laughs> Right. So often the, when we're meditating, we're not actually doing what the Buddha said we should be doing. Yeah? We're doing something else. Yeah? But never mind, we come back, we <coughs> deepen that sense of joy. Yeah? That, that, all, that, that whole process from that first time that we ever heard the Dhamma or gained some kind of perception or insight or realization that it is possible, an escape is possible from this suffering. And that sense of hope leading us on, the sense of faith, the joy that arises, all of the good things that have come from that. And then when we come to sit in meditation, bringing the strength and the power of all those things, you deepen that. And because the, the essence of meditation is awareness, and, and awareness reflecting back on itself, the mind reflecting back and looking at itself. And then when you look back on itself and you see those beautiful, wholesome states of happiness and joy, you keep on reflecting back and seeing that state of joy. And the more you go back and see it again, the deeper it becomes. And the, 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 the broader the mind becomes, the more the mind relaxes, the more awareness becomes clear, the more it becomes expanded. And the more natural that everything becomes. By doing this, you, you're not making your mind into something that it's not. What you're doing is you are allowing the mind to find its true nature. You're allowing the mind to be aware. That's what your mind wants to do. You, you, you want to know. You want to be aware. But our awareness is obscured by all of these defilements. This is what the Buddha was talking about when he talked about the very famous passage on the, the radiant mind, the Pabhasara Chitta. Yeah? And people talk about it as if it's some kind of uh, you know, primordial, original mind or something like that. That's not the point of that passage. It's not what it's talking about. What it's talking about is that if you uh, 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 practice meditation, uh, the clarity and brilliance of the mind shines through because you abandon all of those things which darken the mind and darken your awareness. Actually, there's no such thing. The mind isn't, isn't originally radiant or um, 
defiled or anything like that. The mind isn't originally anything. The mind isn't original. The mind is conditioned. So it's con when the conditions are there for the mind to be dark and full of ignorance, then the mind is dark and full of ignorance. When the conditions are there for the mind to be bright and radiant, the conditions, the, the mind will be bright and radiant. That's all. So when we let go of those things which darken the mind, we let that awareness shine through and we find that sense of uh, uh, clarity and contentment. This is when the mind is moving towards that, what we call samadhi or stillness. Now, so when the mind uh, in samadhi is again at a whole another level of happiness, so much so that in the uh, in the suttas, when the Buddha is talking about uh, sukha, which means pleasure, he often said what, what, what sukha really means, what pleasure really means, is the four jhanas. Uh, for example, uh, when, the, uh, uh, when the monastics do the uh, blessing chant in the morning, ayu wan no sukhang balang, uh, it means long life, uh, 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 beauty, happiness, and health. Okay, so this is the the the, the wish of so somebody who does dana and so on. Then these are the things that come to them. So they all have perfectly straightforward, uh, uh, um, ordinary meanings. But the Buddha also explained them with a spiritual meaning. Yeah. So uh, the the ayu, the the long life, is the four uh, idipadas, four bases of psychic power. The one, uh, the beauty, is uh, the precepts. And the uh, sukha, the pleasure, is the four jhanas, the four states of deep samadhi. And the uh, bala, the health, is the, uh, the, the health or the strength to become an arahant, get rid of all your defilements. So that's really what happens to you when you offer dana to the sangha. Guaranteed. So, uh, So hopefully you'll all be signing up to take Dana down to Santi very soon. You can talk to Ruini to organize this. Anyway, okay. So uh, in that ex kind of experience, when the mind enters into, into samadhi, in that very deep sense of pleasure, there is a complete letting go of the, the sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. There's no experience from those things. Those things are all too coarse. They've all fallen away. It's not that you've push them away or that you, you, you make yourself stop experiencing things. It's just that you don't need them anymore. The mind has gone into a place of contentment and stillness and simplicity, which is so profound that all of that kind of experience is irrelevant and you're not interested in it. The mind just comes into itself. And so this is an experience of such deep uh, pleasure that compared to th that, pretty much anything else is rubbish. And it's on that uh, basis of that, the, uh, that uh, samadhi that then one can develop the deep insight. Through that whole process of unity and pleasure and wholeness that you're developing in your emotions that whole way, at the end of that, the outcome of that is the profound insight into the Four Noble Truths and into suffering. That, that, that teaching which you heard right at the beginning of the path, that teaching which spoke to what you were feeling in your heart, the reason why you came to the teachings in the first place, in hearing that about suffering. And your, your initial insight and understanding into the Dhamma that happened with that, and finally that comes to its fruition after that whole path has gone through. You see suffering truly for what it really is. And of course, the, 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 uh, the, the, the purpose of the path is not to see suffering. The purpose of the path is to be able to let go of suffering. Okay? But as the Buddha was a, a realist, he said, well, you don't let go of suffering by ignoring it and trying to push it away. So that first noble truth, the truth of suffering, the Buddha said, is parinyaya, one of my favorite phrases in the whole of the Buddhist scriptures. Parinyaya, it's to be known all the way through. Okay, so dukkha is to be known all the way through. So that's usually something that 
Well, we, we, we have experience of, of dukkha, but we don't see it all the way through. We only see bits of it. Normally, we, we, we have an aversion towards suffering, right? So when we see bits of it, we try to distract ourselves from it. So to see that Four Noble Truth, we see it all the way through. The, the origin of suffering, to be abandoned, you know, to be let go of. The ending of suffering is Nibbāna, and that's to be realized, to be literally to be seen with your own eyes. And the path, cause the Eightfold Path to be developed, to be made more of. So this is, I think, I hope you agree, is very far from being a, a gloomy path. I think it's a very realistic one, in the sense that it acknowledges the reality of suffering, which is absolutely essential for our spiritual life. We have to be very grateful to suffering. If we didn't suffer, we'd be so lazy and boring. <laughs> and be grateful to suffering. But the suffering we experience is not the, the content of the path. The content of the path is a deeper and deeper experience of happiness and pleasure and contentment. And it's through that that the deep insights come. Okay, so that should be enough for this evening. I offer that for your reflection. Hopefully that wasn't too much suffering to listen to that.